Thank you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the presentation today and the book sale. I'm Jenny Rushlow. I'm the Dean of the Maverick Lloyd School for the Environment, Faculty Director of the Environmental Law Center, and Professor here at Vermont Law and Graduate School. Before I introduce the speaker, I'd like to thank Barrister's Bookstore for selling copies of the book that's featured in today's presentation. If you haven't made a purchase yet, you can do so immediately following the talk right over there where Jess was pointing. And we'll have time for Q&A after the presentation today. If you're watching at home on the BLGS YouTube site, you can enter your questions in the chat or in the comments space at any time. And we'll monitor those and get through everybody's questions um, as many as we can. Today, we're very pleased to welcome John Leshy our speaker. He is a distinguished professor emeritus at the University of California College of Law in San Francisco, formerly known as UC Hastings. His political history of America's public lands, our common ground, was published in 2022 by Yale University Press. It's the first comprehensive history of America's public lands in more than a half century. John Leshy was the solicitor or general counsel of the Interior Department, which is a Senate confirmed position throughout the Clinton administration. Earlier, he was counsel to the chair of the Natural Resources Committee of the U.S. House of Representatives, a law professor at Arizona State, associate solicitor of Interior for Energy and Resources in the Carter administration, an attorney advocate with the Natural Resources Defense Council, and a litigator in the U.S. Department of Justice Civil Rights Division. He also headed the Interior Department transition team for Clinton and Gore in 1992 and was co-lead for Obama and Biden in 2008. His many publications include a book on the Mining Law Act or the Mining Law of 1872 and co-authoring case books on public land and resources law and water law. Today, his talk is titled Our Common Ground, why America's public lands are a political and conservation success story. And he'll discuss how decision-making about public lands has demonstrated our ability to work together for a common good and what this might mean for the current challenges of climate change and biodiversity loss. Please join me in welcoming Professor John Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dean Russell. I'm It's a real pleasure to be here or be back here. I was here several years ago as a visitor for a little while, a few weeks, and I really want to thank uh, Pat Parento, who uh, arranged this since I gave him a call saying I had this day in the middle of October and I'd love to stop by and say hello. And so this turned into this. So I'm really uh, delighted to have this opportunity. Um, let me make clear that when I talk about the public lands, uh, I'm talking about all federal lands uh, held by the national government, managed by four principal agencies uh, indicated on the map here. Um, <clears throat> actually, the, the Bureau of Land Management is the, lar uh, the least known of those, but it manages more land than, than any other, about 40% of the total. Uh, also, I got to point out on this map, Alaska is out of scale because Alaska is actually more than twice the size of Texas, which is not indicated on here, but you couldn't make Alaska as big as it deserves to be. I, that also indicates that Alaska screws up all statistical analysis of federal lands because you know, it's just so damn big and it's got so many federal lands that it, it really uh, kind of uh, screws things up. Um, a lot of land, more than 600 million acres. Uh, and it's remarkable uh, when you think about it that in a country where uh, we celebrate private property and we distrust government, particularly the national government, uh, that the United States government owns and manages uh, almost 30% of the real estate in the entire nation, plus many millions of acres uh, offshore, submerged lands offshore. What's more, these lands are generally open to all and are managed primarily for conservation, recreation, and education. Uh, and they're revered by many Americans. And that's one of the lessons I want to drive home today. Th this surprises many people. Y you know, you sort of describe those facts, and I've given talks on public lands all over the place, and usually the first question is, gosh, I had no idea. How did that happen? And so I would get that question often enough, I thought, well, I'm gonna, I ought to write a book <laughs> and explain how it happened. Uh, and of course, it didn't just happen. It, ha it came about because of a long series of decisions, uh, political decisions. 
made by our representatives in government. Now, what those decisions were and how they came about, that's the core, uh, the core of the book. Now, obviously, a very big story with many moving parts. So I'm going to give you just a snapshot of public land policy uh, and how it evolved over time. Uh, and there's a graph uh, that's in the book that illustrates this. And this, this is sort of the core story told by the book, uh, how the United States came to decide to first hold on to lands that it had acquired by various means. That's the solid line. And then significantly how it came to actually protect those lands from, from most intensive industrial uses that really hold them for, for conservation. And, uh, and uh, that's the dotted line. And then I put the population in the US. So you can sort of see there's a rough correlation uh, there. Um, <clears throat> and the heart of the story, as the lines indicate, really begins uh, late in the 19th century. Uh, really around 1890 was kind of the, the pivot point uh, where the United States government became really serious about hanging on to a lot of lands and then increasingly actually deciding to protect those lands from intensive industrial uses. Now, if you think about it, that was well after, long after uh, Native Americans lost uh, their lands or most of their lands. That, that process was set off by the European invasion triggered by Columbus in 1492. When the United States government was formed in the late 18th century, it continued that process and, and accelerated it. And the, the dispossession of Native American lands came about because of a really a kind of a roving uh, uh, cast of, of characters, speculators, settlers, miners, and other profiteers backed by military force, first of the European invaders and then of the United States government, uh, and formalized almost all the time by treaties and other kind of comparable uh, arrangements. And it was hastened, as most of you probably know, by deadly microbes that the European invaders brought to which the indigenous peoples uh, had little immunity. And that process well underway when the United States government formed continued uh, as the United States acquired more land from foreign governments like through the Louisiana Purchase uh, and the like. Uh, the point here is that it, that process was almost com totally completed by the time the United States began to decide in 1890 to hold on to a significant amount of land and, and, and increasingly uh, to uh, protect it. Um, and uh, so what, what that means is the kind of, if you put it this way, the, 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 those who advocated for holding on to and protecting these lands in national ownership uh, were, were not really important actors in that dispossession because that took place before, usually long before. Um, no, nevertheless, as most of you probably know, important players in that, those lines were like John Muir, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, like most of the non-Indians who lived at that time, uh, regarded the Native American cultures as, as inferior. And I would be the last to admit, having worked in the federal government for uh, quite a few years, that uh, federal land management agencies don't have spotless records. Uh, in dealing with Native Americans and their cultures with respect to these lands, uh, and that appreciation has come slowly, way too slowly, uh, appreciating the, the, what's now called the traditional uh, ecological knowledge that the, that the indigenous peoples had, uh, affecting how these public landscapes uh, work, uh, such as through the use of fire as a management tool. Um, all that said, uh, the core concerns and interests of Native Americans and uh, uh, and supporters of the public lands, protecting the public lands, those concerns overlap a, a great deal. And that, I think, is an important point, especially when we think about the future. Uh, you know, indigenous uh, peoples tend to regard the earth and all living things as connected in many ways. Uh, and so do many uh, non-Indian uh, land protection advocates. Uh, if you think about... Um, uh, how the indigenous worldview of that connection is reflected in uh, famous remarks by John Muir, for example, who said, uh, who, who used to describe these inspiring landscapes as holy temples, uh, and who once famously said, you know, when we try to pick out everything, anything, it's connected to everything else. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, um, uh, furthermore, another interesting point I think to think about is that indigenous cultures tend to be, as one indigenous scholar uh, recently wrote, far more collectivist and uh, communitarian than most Western cultures, than the European invaders were. Uh, and again, if you think about these public lands, well, they reflect communitarian, communitarian uh, uh, 
uh, values and collectivist values because they're held in public ownership and managed for broad purposes uh, to benefit the general public. Uh, now, in recent years, and the one chapter toward the end of my book talks about this in some detail, uh, many Native American tribes have vigorously uh, sought greater consideration of their strong ancestral connections to many of these lands. And that can take various and somewhat overlapping forms. There's uh, one, one way to do it is to provide greater recognition of and, and to strengthen protection for cultural sites. Uh, that are found on the, the public lands. Another is for tribes themselves to become more directly involved in how those lands are managed. That's sometimes captured under the rubric of co-management. Uh, and another is for tribes to get land back, to get title actually transferred back. That's sometimes called the land back movement uh, that is around. Uh, considerable progress has been made on especially the first of those, protecting cultural sites and the like. The other two are quite uh, quite complicated, um, and I'm happy to talk more about that in the Q&A session because I've worked on a bunch of those issues over the years. Um, <clears throat> but uh, put simply, the public lands offer many opportunities for, for broadening cross-cultural connections and redressing past injustices and sort of healing societal wounds. And the appointment of the current Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, the first Native American to be a cabinet member in American history, uh, underscores the movement that is continuing in that direction. Now let me quickly uh, sketch out some of the principal themes to, uh, um, uh, that emerge from the book and, and offer some reflections about what that might mean uh, in terms of what may lay ahead. These themes demolish, I think, some common fictions that have grown up around these, these federal lands. Uh, and these, these fictions, these myths, really do complicate uh, the politics of crafting constructive solutions to the challenges that these lands uh, face. And so I believe exposing these uh, fictions can help make forward progress on these issues somewhat easier to achieve, especially because these lands, like everything else, faces uh, uh, significant challenges in terms of climate change and, and biodiversity uh, loss. Now, the first and most notorious myth, I think, is that the public lands have generally been a divisive force in American life. Um, <clears throat> this myth is partly explained by the fact that many Americans don't know that much about these lands, but they hear about them when there's big controversies. You know, it's like President Trump downsized two big protected areas in, in Utah in 2017, or those armed extremists took over a wildlife refuge in Oregon in 2016, I think it was. So that's how people think about federal lands, and then they think, well, this is a big source of division. Um, my case uh, that I try to make, and I hope make pretty persuasively, is that these are uh, those kind of headline making controversies are sort of fleeting blips. And then, in fact, over time, if you look at history carefully, uh, public lands have tended to bring us together more than it has driven us uh, apart. One example, I won't use this one, uh, one example comes here. The first, the first time the United States Congress ever uh, acted to protect an area of public lands and hold it in common ownership open to all forever came in, in the middle of the Civil War, 1864, when Congress uh, passed a law promoted by California congressmen uh, to set aside the Yosemite Valley, one of the most inspiring places, I think, in the world, uh, and to hold it open forever, inalienable, in governmental ownership. Uh, one major reason that came about, because at the time, very, very few, I mean, handful of, of uh, non-Indigenous people had ever seen Yosemite Valley, and they found out about it through the photographs of the guy on the left, Carlton, Carlton Watkins, who actually invented a big camera uh, to be able to take those, those uh, landscapes. And they were widely circulated in the East, and they got particular attention in New York when they were uh, displayed in a gallery right after the, the first display of Matthew Brady's famous shocking photographs of Civil War dead, because there were very few photographs of dead people at that time. And this contrast between the kind of healing power of landscapes and this awful the tragedy of the war going on uh, was really influential, it turns out, in Congress's decision to say, yeah, we need to protect uh, the Yosemite Valley as an as a inspirational place to heal us uh, 
from our divisions. And, uh, uh, and those were really the, uh, um, um, the, the, the beginning, uh, 1864. Now, the next significant act uh, that did that was 1872, Yellowstone National Park was created. But then 1890 is when the, the kind of uh, serious start to holding and safeguarding uh, public lands. Um, <clears throat> so um, uh, now, um, I should note, by the way, that in uh, 1864 was also the year that a famous uh, Vermonter named George Perkins Marsh published his book called um, uh, Man and Nature. And he was really the first person uh, almost in world history who, who actually uh, pointed out that the United States uh, made that human beings could have irreversible impacts on the, on the planet. Uh, and he had Turns out, great impact on public land policy. All of the early public land protection acts in the legislative history is replete with references to George Perkins March. So Vermont gets some real credit in this story. Um, another example of bringing us together came in the, uh, and there, by the way, is George Perkins March. Um, another example of bringing us together came in 1911. Um, thanks to this guy, John Weeks, uh, a, a banker, member of Congress from Massachusetts, uh, he shepherded through something called the Weeks Act in Congress. It launched a major program of the United States acquiring uh, from private owners lands all over the upper reaches of watersheds in the East, South, and the Midwest, uh, which today form the basis for the national forests and most of the national parks uh, and, and refuges and other protected areas of public lands in the East. That all began in 1911. Uh, most of those lands, by the way, had been logged over, and their aim was to restoration, was to restore the forest, reduce erosion, help protect, uh, prevent destructive uh, floods uh, downstream. When that bill was going through Congress, the governors of the New England states and the governors of the southern states testified on a panel in front of the House. And uh, one of them said, you know, this is the first time in American history that the governors of these two regions has appeared before Congress uh, to testify, uh, to ask for something for the common good and welfare of the United States. And that really kind of told the story. Uh, the Weeks Act eventually resulted in the purchase of more than uh, 20 million acres, uh, about three times the size of Vermont, to establish 52 national forests uh, in more than two dozen states, the East, South, and Midwest, uh, in Vermont, Green Mountain National Forest, you can thank the Weeks Act for that. That all happened in the 1920s after a series of destructive floods convinced the people of Vermont to ask the federal government to acquire from willing sellers with the approval of the state uh, and local officials uh, lands to hold them in common ownership uh, for public use and protection. Uh, <clears throat> now, the second myth is... Um, that public lands have tended to divide Americans along partisan lines. Today, we think about every issue of public policy as you know, red, blue, Republican, Democrat. Uh, but a dominant theme of public land history, remarkable, uh, remarkably, is that uh, on all of this major legislation, it was all bipartisan, substantial. There wasn't partisan disagreements on holding more and more lands in US ownership and protecting them so that all may have opportunities to recreate in and learn from, be inspired by uh, their rich uh, cultural and scientific resources. Uh, there are really as many Republican uh, as Democratic heroes in, in the story uh, that I tell. The New England governors who testified in favor of the Weeks Act were Republicans. The Democrats, the Southern governors who testified in support were Democrats. Uh, they reached across the aisle, uh, got it done. Uh, John Weeks was a Republican. This is another Republican. Uh, by this, I'm just this, these lands in the East, South, and Midwest, the eastern two thirds of the country. Almost all of that is Weeks Act. I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit. <clears throat> Here's another Republican hero. Nobody's ever heard of him. Uh, Fred Seaton, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, Secretary of the Interior. Uh, he was a newspaper publisher in from Nebraska, uh, <clears throat> and uh, Eisenhower named him Secretary of the Interior while he was there. Uh, he protected vast tracts of, of public lands in Alaska, and more than 11 million acres, including the, the iconic uh, Arctic National Wildlife Refuge up on Alaska's north coast, which has been called America's uh, Serengeti. Um, yeah. 
probably have seen that's what the, thank Fred Seaton for that. Um, <clears throat> now the third myth is that most public lands have been safeguarded through a series of land grabs by the federal government over the opposition of state and local officials and local uh, communities. Uh, again, you hear that message over and over. Oh yeah, it's another federal land grab. Well, to the contrary. Um, uh, my book is replete with examples of how petitions from the grassroots really played a key role in the establishment of almost all of these protected areas. Petitions from local chambers of commerce, from governors, from county officials, et cetera, uh, um, from a, uh, resulted in the creation of the national forest system between 1891 and 1909, all driven by local local petitions. Um, <clears throat> in the depths of the Great Depression, Congress followed up the Weeks Act by launching a major, major program to acquire prime habitat uh, into national ownership in, in order to reverse a sharp decline in migratory birds. And most of the lands you'll see in the middle of the uh, uh, country, uh, the blue up there, uh, <clears throat> and uh, so a lot of the coastal areas are wildlife refuges that were acquired by the federal government in order to protect and restore uh, migratory uh, bird habitat. Uh, <clears throat> another program adopted at the same time bought up a bunch of fail failed farms and homesteads to protect what are now called national grasslands in like eastern Montana and the Dakotas and places uh, like that. Uh, again, with local consent and support from willing sellers, not a land grab uh, at all. And uh, <clears throat> that was true in the Green Mountain National Forest, for example. Each acquisition had to be approved under uh, Vermont law by local officials and the governor and the lieutenant governor and the attorney general and two other state officials. Every single acquisition had to be approved. Two of my favorite examples, Big Bend National Park and the Big Bend of the Rio Grande in Texas and the Everglades in the South Florida. Uh, those areas were privately owned, acquired by the state with state taxpayer money and donated to the federal government so they could become national parks. Not a land grab. Now, fourth myth about uh, public land history is that the executive branch of the government uh, President, Secretary of the Interior and the like, made most of these decisions and Congress sort of stood to one side. Um, again, largely myth, especially in the last half, cent half century. It is true from the, around 1890, the first few decades after that, uh, Congress enacted a number of laws that gave the executive broad power to to reserve, they called it, reserve land and national ownership and protect it. That's how the national forest system came about. Uh, Congress passed a law in 1906, you may have heard about, called the Antiquities Act, uh, and it gave the president broad power to protect federal lands that had features of historic and scientific interests, and they were called national monuments. And the interesting story, the reason Congress gave them a label national monuments is because Congress jealously regard, uh, uh, husbanded its power to put a national park label on something. So only Congress can label something a national park. They give the president the power to do approximately the same thing and said, well, that's going to be called a national monument and not a park. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, since the Antiquities Act was enacted in 1906, 18 of the 24 president, the 21 presidents who have served since that act passed have used that act, nine Republicans, nine Democrats, to establish some 150 national monuments, protected areas that cover nearly 100 million acres of land uh, onshore. And then George W. Bush started the practice of using the Antiquities Act offshore to protect marine, submerged marine areas. Um, and, uh, the, and he and Obama, uh, um, Biden hasn't done it yet, I don't think, uh, but uh, he and Obama have protected, uh, Bush and Obama protected uh, tens of millions of acres of submerged lands offshore. Here in New England, you may recall, um, oh, there's uh, Everglades and there's Big Bend to give you an idea of those parks, wonderful places to visit. Um, Obama and uh, 
Um, Obama used the Antiquities Act to protect these two uh, big areas in uh, uh, the Katahdin Woods and Waters, and he established a big marine area offshore. Uh, he was following a century old precedent because Acadia National Park in Maine had been a national monument at first established by President Woodrow Wilson. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, now, these national monuments, initially done by presidents, almost always ratified, confirmed by Congress. Um, not overturned, but, but ratified and confirmed. Uh, and, and Congress not only usually ratified these, it often made the national monuments national parks. That happened to Acadia. Acadia was a national monument created by the president. Three years later, Congress basically said, hey, I want some, we want some of that political credit, so we're going to put a park label on it so we can get the credit for making it a national uh, park. Now, beginning in the 60s, Congress, the, 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 the uh, pattern shifted quite significantly, and this is pretty underappreciated, which is Congress actually started getting back in the game of saying, we've delegated too much power to the president to do this. We want to do more of it. We want to be more active in deciding what lands get protected, preserved, held, and, and how they're managed. And the guy who was responsible for that shift, which is still in effect, basically, was this guy, um, Wayne Aspinall. Interesting story, a very conservative Democrat from Colorado's West Slope. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, he basically led a campaign, personal campaign that succeeded to persuade Congress, we got to get more active in deciding the future of these public lands. Uh, and, he, and he succeeded. Now, what's interesting about it is his first big success was something called the Wilderness Act of 1964, which is the most protective category of federal lands. In, in federally protected wilderness, you can't have industrial activity, no mining, no logging, no road building. Uh, it's, really, uh, it's really stringently managed. Now, the irony here is that Wayne Aspinall didn't like wilderness. He liked industrial uses of federal land. But the most important thing to him was Congress should make that decision. So he insisted that Congress be the gatekeeper of the wilderness system. And so not a single acre goes into the national wilderness system unless Congress has passed a law which puts it there, OK? So no executive running amok. This is Congress making the decision. Now, um, what Aspinall wanted, interestingly enough, uh, was to give people in closer proximity to these lands more say in what happens to them. And, uh, and Aspinall was a, was a crafty member of Congress. And he knew that there was a longstanding custom in Congress, which still prevails today, which is that Congress does, gives members of, individual members of Congress an effective veto over legislation that targets lands in their district. No member of Congress from Ohio will support, uh, uh, or very few will support a bill that puts wilder, uh, an area in Colorado in wilderness because they fear the same the tables will be turned on them if that happens. So there's this unspoken premise that is very powerful in the Congress not to legislate to, with respect to a particular area of lands over the objections of the local members of Congress. And Aspinall knew it worked that way. And that's why I said, hey, if we, give, if we require an act of Congress to get wilderness, we'll have not much land in wilderness because the local members of Congress won't like it. Well, guess what? Uh, he, he it was very, very wrong. He seriously underestimated the support that would develop at the grassroots for limiting in, intensive industrial uses of public lands. So in 1964, the Wilderness Act passed. It was the umbrella, and it said, we're creating this system, and any new lands added to the system have to come through acts of Congress. Well, since 1964, Congress has enacted individual pieces of legislation uh, that has put 800 separate areas of public land, more than 111 million acres, okay, uh, into the wilderness system with the support of the grassroots in those places. That was, that was Aspinall's uh, serious uh, underestimation. Uh, whoops, how did I get that? Here it's... Uh, Here's the National Wilderness System growth. There, initially, there was 9 million acres in the original act, and this is what's happened since. Now, here's where Alaska kind of screws up things. 
that very steep curve between 1975 and 1980 is one single piece of legislation. It's called the Alaska Lands Bill. Uh, and it put, uh, it doubled the size, uh, tripled the size of the wilderness system, very steep. Um, but one other thing to notice about this uh, is the arc goes continually upward. And if you think about it in terms of Republicans and Democrats, it goes upward more in Democrat, in, in, in eras when the Republicans control the presidency and or one or both houses of Congress uh, than when the Democrats uh, do. And that's why I put Reagan in here, <laughs> because um, he actually signed into law more wilderness acres than any other president before or after him, if you take Alaska out of the mix, because Alaska is such a, a special uh, case. <clears throat> and this idea of Congress making these decisions, actually in the, in the Wilderness Act, um, whoops, um, actually unleashed a whole era of legislation where Congress zoned the federal lands. Not only through wilderness, you, you probably have looked at, at, land, uh, at uh, maps showing ownership of federal lands and get, you get dizzy about all the labels on these places, you know, wildlife refuge, there's national conservation areas, there's national recreation areas, national scenic areas, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, those are all congressional labels, the result of congressional statutes uh, that have zoned those areas for particular uses. And they're almost all, in fact, they're all protected. The idea in a national recreation area is it's set aside primarily, it's, Primarily, if not exclusively for recreation, you can't log, you can't uh, mine, uh, uh, and that sort of thing. So each one of those acts, congressional acts, makes really conservation recreation the primary objective uh, of, of management. Uh, and each of those statutes limits agency discretion in terms of how much road building you can have, and mining and timber harvesting either prohibits it or, or strongly uh, discourages it. Uh, and each label highlights the cultural and natural qualities of the area and attracts more recreational users and stimulates recreation-based economic activity, et cetera. And almost without exception, each one of them enacted with the congressional support of the local congressional delegation, the local members of the House and the, and the local Senate, uh, I mean, local senators. <clears throat> Congress has not discriminated among the agencies. This is another kind of hidden point. The four management agencies all manage millions of acres of wilderness, recreation areas, scenic areas, conservation areas, etc. So the distinction among these four agencies is quite blurred now to anybody who looks at it at the ground level. The net effect is regardless of whether it's the Park Service or the Bureau of Land Management or the Forest Service or the Fish and Wildlife Service, all the lands they manage are primarily managed uh, for open space conservation and recreation than anything else. And the idea that Congress is doing this also en enhances the durability of those management prescriptions because Congress hardly ever changes its mind. I don't think it's taken more than a handful of acres out of the wilderness system, having put 111 million acres uh, in. <clears throat> so, uh, it's almost unheard of for Congress to, to weaken protections once they're bestowed on federal lands. Now, I'm, I think you're probably ready to accuse me of uh, painting an overly rosy picture of political consensus on public lands because today we disagree about everything and conflict and division, uh, the order of the day, why should public lands be any different? Uh, but my book makes the case, tries to make the case, and I think it's a strong case that the overall direction of public land policy has not changed in the last several administrations. Let me give you a few quick examples. In the 1970s, there was something, late 1970s, something called the Sagebrush Rebellion uh, erupted. Uh, may have heard about that dimly. It was a DC journalist gave us that label. He was looking for a, she was looking for a snappy headline. Uh, primarily promoted by holders of public land grazing permits who were unhappy that they were going to be regulated more. And so they persuaded uh, uh, several Western states to pass laws to claim title to own uh, at least some federal lands. They just, they just asserted title in state laws. Uh, and it was, so it was called the Sagebrush Rebellion. Got a lot of publicity. The, the, level, the, the label rebellion seemed formidable. Uh, 
It was not a serious political movement. It never went anywhere. It fizzled quickly. None of the rebel states ever tried to litigate their claim uh, that they owned these lands or take any other step to enforce them. <coughs> Congress never took it seriously. Neither did the executive branch. Neither did the American people, including the people in the states that were ostensibly rebellion, re re rebelling. It was a, it was a, it was a stunt, uh, and it fizzled. The bipartisan consensus in favor of the U.S. holding and protecting more and more lands held. It easily survived another hiccup when Ronald Reagan, uh, in his first term, was persuaded by some libertarian economists to uh, sale, uh, offer for sale 35 million acres of public lands scattered around that the, that the government said was surplus. Um, uh, it was the idea was to balance the federal budget uh, by getting some revenue uh, from these land sales. Triggered opposition across the board, found no support among Republicans or Democrats in Congress, went nowhere. Um, Reagan, astute politician, uh, moved swiftly to the middle and ended up uh, working with Congress and, uh, and followed that well-worn path to protect more lands. Ended up, as I said, signing into law more wilderness legislation than outside of Alaska than any other president uh, before or after him. Signed 28 separate bills uh, at a time when the Republicans controlled the Senate, in other words, one of the houses of Congress, uh, and life continued. Pattern held through subsequent administrations. Newt Gingrich leads a rebellion to have the Republicans take over the House in 1994, uh, the contract with America. Totally silent on public lands, not an issue. The, 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 the Republican messaging guru who drafted the contract with America, which was very successful politically, uh, later uh, told uh, the, the GOP, uh, leave the the Public lands alone, the most popular federal programs today, this is what he said, Frank Luntz was his name, was specifically conservation of public lands and waters through parks and open spaces. And Luntz's advice uh, still prevails. Um, and uh, so the chart tells the story. It's still up, 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 continually up. Uh, now, it's true that Congress has acted somewhat less often to do this than it has in the last, say, 15 years or so than it has before. But it's still enacting these laws and protecting more and more lands. Usually now they package a bunch of different local laws together in what's called omnibus public lands bills. So in early 2009, President Obama signed into law the uh, uh, omnibus public land protection bill that had been crafted uh, when the Republicans controlled the White House and uh, one House of Congress, but it didn't actually get enacted until early in the Obama administration. He signed it into law, added millions more acres to the wilderness system, uh, established four new national conservation areas, added three new units to the national park system, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all that means is that today, mining, drilling, industrial uses, large scale commercial logging, uh, take place on really only a re relatively small proportion of all of those 600 plus million acres of federal lands. Okay, now I know some of you are saying, but didn't the Trump administration break that pattern? After all, you said he, he downsized two big national monuments in Utah uh, <clears throat> that Presidents Clinton and Obama established and, uh, and didn't make numerous other efforts to uh, bend public land policy away from protection and toward fossil fuel, industrial exploration, uh, exploitation and the like. Uh, yes, true, but a strong case can be made, I think, that these, again, were kind of aberrational hiccups and did not signal a fundamental change in the arc of protection. Uh, first of all, he only shrank two monuments. He didn't abolish them, and he left all the other monuments cre created by his predecessors alone. Uh, more than 100 million acres. Uh, even more important, before Trump left office, he signed into law two major pieces of public land protection legislation. 2019, it was another one of these omnibus bills. It added more than uh, a million acres in several states to the national wilderness system, expanded several national park system units. Uh, one no a noteworthy piece of that bill actually added protection. I think I have a slide on this. This is Trump. Uh, this is the rally for the Bears Ears National Monument, and then this is Trump uh, signing the proclamation that downsized it. Um, 
this is the Grand Staircase and Bears Ears National Monument. It's what they look like. Uh, this is an area. Uh, I need a little. Uh, the San Rafael, where it says San Rafael River, the dark green area, that was protected in 2019, two years after Trump downsized the two big Utah monuments. The local congressman in Utah led an effort, successful effort, to protect that area around the San Rafael River, public lands in that area. Um, uh, almost a stone's throw, literally, or you know, figuratively speaking, from the Bears Ears and the uh, uh, Grand Staircase National Monuments. Supported, by the way, that protection bill, supported by the entire Utah uh, delegation. Um, another component of that 2019 bill that Trump signed uh, made permanent the, something called the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which was set up by Congress in 1964. And it provides a stream of money to buy more land into public ownership, state, local, and federal, uh, for conservation and recreation and the like. Uh, it had formerly been uh, a temporary fund that had to be reauthorized by Congress every few years. In 2019, Congress said it's permanent. We don't have to reauthorize it anymore. Trump signed that into law. And the next year, signed into law an even more significant piece of legislation called the Great American Outdoors Act strong bipartisan support. Uh, it made an even more important change in the Land and Water Conservation Fund because when the fund was originally set up, Congress had to decide each year. It, 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 the fund is built up by a stream of revenue from uh, mostly mineral development on federal land, especially offshore petroleum. So there's a stream of money coming in, but Congress said, we, we have to approve every dollar that goes out year by year. In 2020, Congress said, no, we're not doing that anymore. Uh, where any money that comes in can be spent without our further approval. And uh, since 1964, $40 billion had come into the fund, and Congress had only approved the expenditure of $20 billion. So the 2020 legislation actually unleashed a, a huge supply of new money for conserving, acquiring, conserving, and protecting lands in public ownership. A major victory. Some, some called it the most important land conservation measure in a generation, Bipartisan, signed into law by President Trump. Now, a year later, uh, President Biden restored the two Utah monuments that uh, Trump downsized. Uh, the state of Utah uh, has filed a lawsuit challenging uh, Biden's restoration, uh, making the radical claim, by the way, that the Antiquities Act uh, uh, made it, it was illegal for the president to use the Antiquities Act to protect these big, awesome landscapes, that, that the president had used that power, as I said, uh, nine Republicans, nine Democrats to protect 111 million acres. And here comes Utah saying that was all illegal. Uh, the, the court, by the way, recently dismissed the lawsuit. It's up on, on appeal. Uh, knowledgeable observers, by the way, uh, chuckled when they saw Utah's lawsuit with this very radical view of the Antiquities Act. Uh, because uh, for years, the Utah Office of Tourism uh, had run a very successful campaign to attract visitors to what it called Utah's Mighty Five National Parks. It even trademarked that, that uh, slogan, uh, Utah's Mighty Five National Parks. Uh, what, the, what the Utah Office of Tourism didn't tell you is that four of those five were first protected by presidents using the Antiquities Act that the state attorney general is now trying to you know, uh, uh, radically uh, re reinterpret. Um, OK. Now, Americans have long argued about the role that the national government should play in American life. Uh, but I think the public lands are a big exception to that general rule. Now, of course, like on just about every issue where people, uh, most Americans are in agreement, there are always some noisy you know, dissenters, people hostile to just about everything the government does. But opinion polls uh, have consistently shown everywhere around the country uh, that an overwhelming majority of people all around the nation, regardless of political power, strong, uh, a political party, uh, uh, strongly agree that holding and protecting large amounts of land in national ownership, open to all, has been extraordinarily uh, beneficial. Uh, I'll get back to the chart, uh, as, as this chart um, captures. So uh, Secretary Holland recently said, you know, the public lands are central to our national identity and inspiration to countries around the world. 
and I think most Americans believe that, actually. Again, without regard for political party. It's a political success story. It shows the political process working the way it's supposed to work, which is, you know, politicians are supposed to listen to the people and then enact their wishes into law. I, I make the argument that the public lands are the political system doing uh, exactly that. And I think bringing attention to that success story is really important in our polarized era, um, where so many people are skeptical that anything good can ever come out of uh, the nation's capital. It's a major reason I wrote the book. It's not, by the way, creeping socialism. Everybody who lives in areas where there are abundant public lands know that these, uh, they provide many opportunities for private enterprise. Um, <coughs> uh, the, the poll results reflect how, um, how tourism and recreation dependent businesses have become a major economic driver in many of these small communities, making the economic contributions of traditional activities like logging and mining uh, and livestock grazing pale by comparison. Now, let me look forward uh, briefly and address how public lands can help meet the huge challenges we face of climate change and biodiversity uh, loss. Uh, for one thing, it seems to me the political, pro the political success story I've just described is a shining example of how to meet these big challenges. Because dealing effectively with these challenges requires the political will to decide that society's collective long-term interests must outweigh shorter-term, narrower interests. And that's exactly what the public lands have shown. That's what the history of public lands shows, how time and again the political system has done exactly that, uh, from preserving, uh, for, for preserving iconic places for the public to enjoy, to restoring denuded, logged-over lands like in the Green Mountains here, to acquire wildlife habitat, to rebuild migratory bird populations. Uh, many of these efforts have produced jobs uh, and stimulated ec economic activity. Uh, in short, uh, America's public land policy has for well over a century of, uh, mostly followed Theodore Roosevelt's advice as he was leaving office in 1909. He said, to look, the public lands should be used for permanent public good instead of merely for temporary private gain. Now, it's also worth emphasizing, uh, frankly, uh, it's, most of you probably know, the U.S. record of preserving these large amounts of landscapes has been very influential uh, around the world because many other countries uh, have moved in the same direction. Um, <clears throat> and there are other uh, hopeful developments in, in recent years. Uh, for example, while about a quarter of the total fossil fuel production comes from public lands, uh, proposals to open more public lands to to uh, fossil fuel development usually triggered strong and, and almost always bipartisan uh, opposition. Now, a rare exception to this came in uh, 2017, and this is an example worth dwelling on for a minute. The Trump administration pushed through Congress on a strict party line vote, legislation uh, allowing it to open up the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, that, that air, large area, the America Serengeti in northern Alaska, protected first by Fred Seaton. Uh, to petroleum development. The oil industry had been after this for 40 years. They finally won on a strict party line vote in 2017. Um, and guess what? The bid, the, the sale, the first sale was happened in January of 2021. It was a giant bust. The oil companies decided not to show up. They didn't bid. The, 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 the legislation was sold in Congress with the argument, this is going to raise billions and billions of dollars to help reduce the national deficit. There were like 14 bidders on some of the tracks. Many tracks went without bidding. The total amount bid was $10 million, um, uh, not billions, as was uh, promised. Um, the Biden administration, by the way, recently voided the few outstanding leases that were all held by a unit of the state of Alaska. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, this was a kind of an object lesson of what the, the future looked like, I think, in terms of fossil fuel development on, on uh, public lands. Um, so um, now, obviously, uh, I do want to mention that the taking strong, forceful action that, that is needed uh, to decarbonize the economy, to deal with the climate problem, uh, poses a lot of challenges for public lands. 
specifically how to deal with them for when you face proposals for renewable energy, wind farms, solar farms on public lands, uh, needed upgrading of transmission lines. You can't do that in many parts of the country without using public lands. Uh, some public lands are sites for so-called strategic minerals that are needed for the electrification of the economy, lithium, the cobalt, uh, uh, nickel, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, so each of those can be important to this decarbonizing effort, and each will put, pose some interesting challenges for public land uh, managers. Now, they usually triggered grassroots opposition. I've worked in the public lands area for a long time. I can, I can guarantee you that every acre of public land has a friend, okay? And so the, the kind of NIMBY idea <laughs> exists as much on public lands as it does on, on private lands. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, so there's opposition to every wind farm, every solar farm, every new transmission line, et cetera. Uh, and that poses some real problems, real challenges, actually, for, for conservationists and longtime advocates for protecting public lands, because, frankly, you got to make some difficult choices. you got to make some difficult uh, trade-offs. Um, <clears throat> uh, and because most of the conservation groups, it's in their DNA to oppose industrial development, it requires a kind of a shift, a rethinking to decide, well, okay, what are we going to do? What should we do about this wind farm or proposal or this, this solar farm uh, proposal? Um, see, uh, um, now, um, difficult challenges, trade-offs required. We're just beginning to wind ourselves through that maze. That's where the action is going to be, I think, in the next few years in terms of public land policy. Um, now, one, one final word before I close, and that is, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, note uh, one other important development uh, in recent years that could also further complicate a great deal how public land policy uh, responds to climate change and, and biodiversity loss. That's the Supreme Court's uh, abrupt, uh, sharp turn toward more conservative uh, activism. Uh, since the 1890s, and this is this is different in the public lands area, really, from most environmental regulation. Since the 1890s, the United States Supreme Court has taken a, 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 a generally a hands-off attitude toward public land policy. They let, say, the executive branch and the congressional branch, they deal with it. And the courts really don't play a role and haven't played an influential role in public land policy, generally speaking. But we see signs of a, of a turn. In 2021, Chief Justice Roberts wrote an interesting little memo that he attached to a, a court opinion uh, <clears throat> made public uh, that suggested that after more than a century of looking the other way, the Supreme Court ought to actually get involved and, uh, and take a look at how presidents have used the Antiquities Act. There's plenty of precedent where the courts have said, it's up to the president to decide. And there's no meaningful judicial review. Chief Justice Roberts said in this memo, uh, maybe it's time we take a look at that. Um, now, nothing's happened since, so we don't know if this is going to go somewhere, but um, um, <clears throat> uh, but the federal courts could be a much bigger player on this stage, uh, my point is, than, uh, than they have been previously. Okay, let me, let me close by going back to where I started. Um, the political process ultimately uh, sets public land policy. The future of public lands will be decided by, uh, by the officials we choose to govern us. Um, the American people have the final word. There's nothing in the Constitution that says you have to have public lands. Congress could privatize it all tomorrow by passing a single act of Congress. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of easy to do politically. It takes an ordinary act of Congress. And Congress and the president can also starve public lands of uh, public land managers of funds to grapple with the problems they face, uh, growing number of recreational uh, users, et cetera, et cetera. That makes it harder for them to fulfill their stewardship mission, and that in turn um, undermines public confidence and with it public support for public lands. So there are risks there. What it boils down to is this. Each new generation of Americans must uh, effectively decide what it wants to do with these lands. Without political support, they and the values they bring to our culture and our way of life can be lost. Um, <clears throat> so, put a little differently, the future of these lands may be determined largely by how Americans and rising generations, uh, uh, like students here, react to the changes now underway. Big questions. Will, will, support, will voters continue to support public lands? 
uh, as a changing climate takes its toll, uh, as biodiversity suffers, as more and more iconic places become more and more crowded. Uh, what if we uh, uh, reject rather than respect the teachings of science? Uh, if partisan rhetoric intensifies, if the American political system becomes more dysfunctional, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The answers will determine whether this arc of protection whoops, uh, continues to rise or uh, turns, pivots. Um, for public lands to have a bright future, more diverse generations from all walks of life uh, need to engage with them and with the political system that determines their future. And so I encourage, uh, I, I am encouraged at how young people are doing more of that, that, where they can make a big difference. Good policy does, doesn't happen in the public lands area or anywhere else. People have to advocate for it. Richard Nixon, Republican, in 1971 said, Public lands give the, the nation breathing space. I really like that, that, uh, that phrase. It's a vast public asset, he said, that nurtures national pride, physical and mental health, a spirit of community and an increasingly diverse nation, offers countless millions of people life-changing life encounters with nature. At the same time, the public lands uh, have become an economic anchor, um, tourism in particular, and of many communities. And it has also, as I mentioned at the beginning, begun rather tardily to uh, better reflect societal diversity and to acknowledge past injustices. Uh, although historically Native Americans, women, people of color were largely excluded from the political system and therefore largely excluded from uh, participating in many of the key dis early decisions in particular of public land policy, that's no longer the case happily. Uh, these lands remain subject to the will of the electorate, and the electorate is defined more broadly than ever before. So these lands can, and I think will be used to help redress uh, past injustices and, uh, and again, demonstrate our ability as a people over and over to work together to find common ground. In his seminal work, The Wealth of Nations, uh, the, um, uh, published the same year, by the way, as the Declaration of Independence, the Scottish philosopher Adam Smith uh, who was a champion of free market capitalism, made a strong case for private ownership of land. But for a single exception, a great and civilized nation, he wrote, ought to hold and uh, own and hold lands for the purposes of pleasure and magnificence for everyone's benefit. That the national government responding to public opinion has heeded Smith's advice is a bipartisan success story. Uh, deserving a celebration, and it's a welcome counter to the political polarization and distrust that currently plagues us. Thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take some questions. So we'll, we'll take a couple of questions um, for folks that are watching online. If you enter your questions in the chat, we'll ask those in the room, and I'll just leave it to you. To mm -hmm. Moderate. Fine. Ah, I've silenced you all. Aha, Professor Echevarria. Uh, I'll pull you out. <laughs> um, picking up on one of your last points about the possible lurking threat posed by the modern Supreme Court uh, to all your happy talk, um, <laughs> I recall, uh, and, I don't, and maybe I, don't, I want you to, to uh, re remind me and, and discuss the implications of this. Five, ten years ago, there was sort of a movement in, in, in the activist world, in the academic world, focusing on the property clause. Uh, and the argument was made that, you know, this is great, all this stuff that's been erected and Congress was all involved, but if you look carefully at the Constitution and the property clause, there really isn't an adequate constitutional basis for the federal government to own and manage all this land. The framers never had in mind that the, that the United States government would hold and manage one third of the nation's land. And, and I remember uh, discussing this with you many years ago, but I'm just curious uh, what you make of today of that argument and what has become of that, of that argument and whether that's something to keep in mind uh, because the U.S. Supreme Court, Justice, uh, Chief, uh, the Chief Justice might uh, decide that's worth looking at. Um, uh, it's an interesting point, but I, I think I think the court is like, well, I won't even say that. 
Robert signaled that the court might change its mind about deferring to the agency, to the executive branch, in terms of uh, interpreting acts of Congress. He didn't say anything about constitutional interpretation. That property clause ar argument has been out there for 150 years. It was actually originally designed, interestingly enough, by a Supreme Court justice uh, who was trying to defend slavery. And he was concerned in the pre-Civil War era <laughs> that if Congress could use its power over federal property to advance the end of slavery. And so he came up with this narrow interpretation of the property clause, which was never followed after the Civil War and has no support in any post-Civil War Supreme Court opinion. Uh, but it was picked up in the 70s in that Sagebrook Rebellion era as a, as a possible way to litigate some restrictions. Uh, but it, it never got any traction. And I don't think people don't write about it anymore. It's, uh, it doesn't appear in Supreme Court briefs. I don't know of any pending case that raises a, a property clause issue. So I don't think the action from the courts or the trouble from the courts, if you want to put it that way, is going to come from constitutional interpretation. I, I, would, be, I would be totally, totally shocked if the property clause got uh, revived. Uh, but that's not to say the courts can do a lot. They can can do a lot by simply interpreting statutes more narrowly and uh, that sort of thing. Um, but it's an interesting point. I mean, one of the reasons I bring it up, there's a lot of talk in the air, for example, about uh, uh, Chevron deference. And should the courts, for the lawyers in the room, should the courts, uh, or the law students, should the courts continue to defer to executive branch interpretation of statutes? Uh, <clears throat> And, or should they be more aggressive about that? I don't think that poses that much of an issue for public lands either. Uh, unlike environmental laws like the Clean Air and Clean Water Act, where EPA uh, has to exercise a lot more kind of broad judgment on things. In the public lands area, because as I said, Congress has written most of the rules, the specific rules, there's not a lot of discretion there, you know. Uh, to open up wilderness areas because the statutes that put land in wilderness say no road building. So you can't build a road in, in, in wilderness areas. So I think the courts, the risk of courts upsetting the apple cart here is, is relatively small. I mean, I'm troubled by what, what Roberts kind of indicated in this opinion. But again, and I tend to be an optimist on these things, but uh, I'll, I'll still be surprised if the courts get heavily involved. And I'll be totally shocked if they got involved on the constitutional issue. I just don't think that ha is happening, would happen. And I wrote a long article about this, which I'm happy to send to anybody who wants it about the origins of the narrow interpretation of the property clause and why the Supreme Court justice in 1840 did what he did. <laughs> yes, Courtney. I have a two part question from one of our online viewers. The first part asks, could you clarify if National Wildlife Refuge require congressional and or executive branch designation? OK. Um, they can be done both ways, and they have been done both ways. Um, the presidents have the power to create refuges by executive order. Actually, the Secretary of the Interior does, if I remember correctly. It doesn't have to be the president. Can do it by executive order, but Congress has also frequently done it. Uh, so it's, it can be done either way. Uh, now, many some refuges are created out of already federally owned lands, but most of the refuges, because they're targeted at areas where migratory bird patterns or there's a population of wildlife you want to protect and all that, those are often private lands, so they're acquired. That's where the Land and Water Conservation Fund I mentioned comes into play in big time because you need money to acquire those targeted areas for refuges. So. That usually comes about uh, because uh, through that mechanism, through the acquisition mechanism. And the second part is? The second part is, do you think our public lands laws are sufficient for addressing the challenges of the future? Or if you could create a new law to durably further the cause of conservation, what would it be? I am generally, uh, I don't think we need major changes in the laws. I think the laws, the laws are pretty heavily tilted in the direction of protection now. And even though you can, the government can lease some land. I mean, there are technically speaking, a few hundred million acres of lands that are open to oil and gas leasing that will never be leased. Uh, and like I said, most lease sales now um, get heavily contested. And I think they're just gonna diminish. Uh, through the process of public pressure, like in the Arctic Refuge and all of that. 
Uh, and the laws generally give the executive branch, the managers of these lands, uh, quite a bit of, uh, a lot of authority to, to protect. Uh, what the risk is more, um, I think, the funds, because if you don't fund these agencies to manage the lands, especially when they're getting overrun with, with uh, tourists, we're going to love a lot of these lands to death, and that takes... It takes funds to manage the crowds and, you know, decide what can happen where and all of that. And if if you don't fund these agencies, and, and the good news is, two, two pieces of good news. One is federal land managers, even though this is a vast amount of land, the amount of dollars in the budgets of these four agencies is a tiny, tiny fraction of the overall federal budget. I mean, it's not even a drop in a bucket. It's, it's, it's tiny. So it doesn't take that much money to uh, manage these lands. And the second piece of good news is the 2020 um, uh, Great American Outdoors Act put large, that President Trump signed into law, put a large amount of new money into lands. The, the, the federal land management budgets had been kind of declining gradually over the years. And here comes 2020, there's a big influx of funds, which was badly needed, and they need to continue to sustain that. But I'm pretty hopeful there, because you don't see a lot of partisan division over the need to fund these agencies adequately. Everybody has a stake in that, I think. Yes. I have a question about appropriations. So you mentioned the permanent appropriation <clears throat> under the Land and Water Conservation Fund. And um, the Supreme Court is considering an open-ended appropriation in the Consumer Finance Protection mm -hmm. Bureau case. I'm wondering if you think that case has implications for this permanent appropriation, or is there something that would distinguish it? Um, I haven't studied that closely, but my strong instinct is it doesn't affect it, because Congress was very clear here uh, in what it was doing in the 2020 Act. And so I, I, there's no room for... for, for Judicial second guessing, I don't think, because uh, that's exactly. I mean, that was the only. That's why Congress did it. It was very specific. Uh, the money comes in, it comes out. It, it, Congress already created the mechanism that brought the money in, and now they said it goes out once it's in. That is an executive function. So, again, I'd be surprised um, uh, if that turned out to be a problem. You've made a convincing case on, and lots of things about the national uh, 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 government and its ownership of public lands. Sitting here in Vermont, we're next to New York State, where its biggest um, and one of the most significant pieces of public lands in the East is state done, the Adirondack Park. Um, uh, what, how would uh, including states in your narrative uh, change it, enhance it, uh, make it? Is it just trivial by comparison? What, what, what? That's, a, that's a really interesting question, and but it, it's it's a very complicated answer. Uh, New York actually is uh, was very influential. Its decisions on the Adirondacks. Uh, initially to protect a lot of lands there, came in the late 1880s, right before Congress followed the same thing. So New York kind of provided a model for Congress uh, to do with the federal public lands, what New York was doing with its state lands. Uh, and New York has kind of jealously guarded that, and there's not a lot of federal, not many federal lands in New York at all, and it's sort of largely a state function. Elsewhere, it's a much more mixed picture. In the West, Congress gave each new state a lot of lands. Uh, uh, in, it gave Utah and New Mexico and Arizona, for example, 10% of the real estate in the state was given to Utah by the Congress as a, as a gifted statehood. But uh, the states all took that land into what they call public trust, and the trust is not what we normally, many law students think of as public trust managing for conservation. The trust was to produce income for the common schools. It was a school land grant. And the idea was we're giving the states these lands and they should maximize the income from these lands, which means lease them for oil and gas and whatever, mining, et cetera. So the state lands with a nudge from the federal government uh, is actually more exploited uh, than the federal lands, which are managed mostly for conservation. So, and that's a that's been a growing issue in many of these western states. Is what do we do about these these state lands that we, you know, some of them we'd like to protect and manage primarily for recreation and all that, but we have this kind of legal obligation to maximize income, and so we've got to lease them if if there's interest in leasing them, and that's become a, a 
pretty controversial issue in many states. So the answer, the short answer is, is there's not, it's a, it's a complicated issue in terms of what states do with the lands that uh, they manage. This, we'll have one more. Oh, sorry. Okay, I think I can. And I'll stick around afterwards if anybody wants to. Uh, you've highlighted uh, this really big trade-off that we face with the need to build generating and transmission infrastructure uh, to mitigate carbon emissions and solve this massive problem, uh, which is also a, a problem to, to our public lands and to the public well-being. Are there existing legal frameworks or management practices that we can look to to help us kind of understand how to adjudicate between these trade-offs? Yeah, it's a really good question. And the, the short answer is everybody's groping and looking for the, that kind of framework. I don't think there's one kind of... Uh, the federal government generally has um, uh, complete power to turn down uh, wind farms and solar farms and all of that. Th that's a discretionary decision by the government to allow them. Uh, but that doesn't answer the question because it just opens it up to controversy as to when to allow it, under what conditions. And that's something that a lot of land managers and a lot of conservation advocates and and Native American groups that have an inf interest in particular lands are all grappling with right now. I had a, I worked with a guy, this is a kind of personal story, but it kind of brings the problem home. I worked with a guy in the, in the Clinton administration. Uh, he was in the White House and uh, he and I put together the paperwork to, for President Clinton to pr protect a, a, uh, an area, BLM land in Idaho uh, in, a, in a national monument. Uh, and the area was a Japanese American internment camp uh, in World War II, and so it was a historic site. And uh, and Congress ended up, you know, uh, confirming it and all that. So he calls me up a couple of years ago, and uh, I hadn't talked to him in a while. And he said, "John, you got to help me. You know a lot about public lands, and uh, the 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 Minidoka National Monument is being threatened by this big industrial project." And I said, oh, well, tell me about it. Let's talk. And I said, what kind of project? He said, it's a big wind energy project. <laughs> and I said, Dan, you know, uh, uh, he said, my father was born in that camp. I do not, you know, I am personally offended. That's why I say every acre of land has a, uh, he said, I, I can't stomach the idea of having wind towers over this campsite. Well, so the BLM, there's been a big controversy in Idaho. Uh, and the BLM is now, uh, currently, they haven't made a final decision, but they've moved the, the wind farm like eight miles away. But it's still visible, you know. And I know Dan says we don't want to see it at all. Well, you know, if it's this tall on the horizon, you know, what, what's the trade-off here? Uh, and, and I got, personally, I would say, yeah, don't have the towers loom over the camp. But if it's visible on the horizon, I don't know. We need wind energy. And if we don't do some of this in some of these places, Everybody's going to be worse off. It's the classic, you know, perfect is the enemy of the good. So every, that kind of dilemma is facing lots and lots of places. And, uh, you know, there's no easy path through that. But I've thought, I talked to, uh, spent a couple of days with an environmental group in Idaho uh, a few, uh, couple of months ago. And uh, uh, I asked them what they were doing about this kind of stuff. And they, they were very thoughtful. I was very impressed. You know, it's like we, we work through this. You got to get the facts. You got to talk to everybody, you know, and the agencies are trying to do that. So I'm, I, you know, there are going to be some controversial decisions made, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident that uh, overall we'll be moving in the right direction. Because if we don't, we're, we're all worse off. I think that's that's clear. Now that's not to say you have to mine every ounce of lithium, regardless of whether it's found, uh, well, where it's found, or uh, build a wind farm everywhere, or whatever. I mean, uh, we're going to have to make hard trade-off decisions. Uh, but some of it will be allowed, and I, I don't have a problem with that. OK, I'll just uh, remind everybody that if you'd like to buy the book, you can go over here where Barristers uh, is. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining. The recording will be available online, so if, if you didn't get enough today, you can go back for more. Thank you so much, Professor Lynn. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>